Hello and welcome to Comic Culture. I'm Terrence Dollard, a professor in the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. Today we're going to be talking about this past June's Heroes Con that took place in Charlotte, North Carolina. Now Heroes Con is a great convention if you are a fan of comics. It's not where you're going to find celebrities from your favorite TV series or news about the new movies that are coming out. It's going to be a lot of comic fans showing up in great costumes, looking through long boxes, meeting comic writers, artists, uh, and editors, and getting a, a great opportunity to you know, really explore their hobby of comics. Uh, one of my favorite conventions of all time is Heroes Con. It's uh, very well run, and even though it's very crowded, they always find enough room for you that you don't feel like you're packed in like a can of sardines. Now, why I love Heroes Con is because it is just about exclusively comics. Um, and one of the things that I enjoy doing is walking around Artist Alley and finding different people that I can talk to. On this show, I'm going to be sharing with you some interviews with artists and writers that I met at Heroes Con. And the first person I'm going to talk to uh, is Andy Hirsch, and he's working on a series of all-ages books. Uh, he just wrapped up the Baker Street Peculiars for uh, Kaboom, and he's also working on Varmints, which is his own uh, creator-owned project. Now, what really caught my attention, and you'll see it at the beginning of this clip, is that he has a banner up of a, a dog wearing a cape riding a motorcycle, and to me, that's just about the coolest thing ever. Let's take a look at that interview. Um, now, Andy, I'm taking a look at your table. I see you've got some uh, Garfield books here. Can you tell us about your work with Garfield? Uh, yeah, I worked on Garfield for several years, actually, um, just doing various licensed books at, at Booms, kind of jumped around, but Garfield was always, always my main one. I um, I started just as kind of a fill-in artist for uh, an issue that, we, that you know somebody dropped out. We need we need somebody fast, and um, it's never left. So I got a good three years being the lead artist on on uh, on that book, and uh, it was really fun because you know I it was it was easier to get into than I thought because I read so much Garfield as a kid, so it was kind of just came natural. Okay, so from Garfield, from working on a licensed property, uh, I'm imagining that with that comes a lot of professional discipline, hitting deadlines, making sure that you're on model. Uh, oh, and does that lead you to your own book? Uh, yeah, I think it, it um, you know, it's a way of proving that, you know, you can be punctual, you can be professional, you can, you know, you can deal professionally with people. And so um, since, uh, since Garfield ended, uh, the last, the book I did next with Boom is called The Baker Street Peculiars, which uh, co-created with Roger Langridge, um, who I just, oh man, been a fan of for ages. He's so great. It's kind of a Sherlock Holmes meets Scooby-Doo type thing. It's um, three kids from very different backgrounds uh, in 1930s London solving the cases that are just too weird for Sherlock to take on himself. And there's, some, there's some central mysteries about the actual identity of Sherlock in there. And uh, yeah, I, I'm really proud of how it came out. It just wrapped up last week, and so far the reception's been, been, been good. Now, you come to a con like this, um, what, what sort of artwork do you do? Because I know that a lot of artists do sketches, and I see you've got one of Squirrel Girl. Uh, so I'm just wondering, it's very hard to say, by the way, Squirrel Girl. Um, so I'm just wondering, uh, do you do a lot of sketches of Garfield? Do you do other people's characters, or do you get to work on your own stuff? Uh, let's see. I've only done one Garfield this weekend, actually. Um, none. Let's see. All right. Let's check the list. We had some Star Wars stuff, wrestlers, uh, Amazing Man, Vanilla Ice. Just man, all over the place. All right. No one has asked for a single duplicate this entire weekend. But yeah, all over the place, and still going. We got a day and a half left of the show, so we'll see. Now, one of the things that you'll uh, come across at a convention is writers and artists of multiple generations. And a lot of times we are uh, fans of the, the writers and artists who work on books of our youth, and we get a chance to meet them at uh, a show like Heroes Con. But what we don't know is that a lot of these writers and artists were working uh, as freelancers. They weren't guaranteed a pension. They didn't get health insurance. Uh, and there's a charity uh, that had a table at Heroes Con called the Hero Initiative. And we met with one of the, uh, the folks who works for that organization to find out exactly uh, how that group is helping comic writers and artists uh, handle medical bills and other emergencies that come up in what can be a rather difficult uh, working situation. Chris, what is the Heroes Initiative and how can people get involved with this uh, organization? Well, the Hero Initiative is a safety net for comic book creators and we're a, we help them with anything from 
uh, hospital bills, medical, you know, any type of medical bills, put food on the table, um, get them back on their feet. Uh, it just depends on, you know, sometimes life is cruel and, you know, things happen and sometimes they're just knocked down. We try to help them get back up. Um, we show up, we raise money, um, artists come in and do sketches and things like that to help us raise money. We set out buckets at their tables. They do uh, signings to raise money. And um, I've been doing this for 15 years and I really believe in helping these guys because you know, they're a great bunch. They're my, my second family. Okay, so when we see movies like The Avengers or Captain America, um, we're seeing the characters, but the creators who work on the characters aren't the celebrities that the actors are. So um, why would a, a comic writer or artist need an organization like the Hero Initiative? Um, just because, pretty much that reason, because they're not treated as they should be as the actual creators. And I mean, granted, they get um, recognized, but... You know, these are the guys that created these characters and uh, created all of this and have always been here and you should celebrate what they've done. And I think they, they should celebrate what they've done. Um, yeah, the, the actors do their job. It's just a job, just like theirs is a job, but they actually created the characters. They came from their minds and, and their hands and drawings and their, their creativeness that, that did all of it. So yeah, we should celebrate them just like you do the actors and actresses that play the characters. You know, they're just not in that forefront like the actors and actresses. So, you know, celebrate what they do. Because of them, we have those movies. And if someone's watching at home and they wanted to uh, make a donation, how could they get more involved and, and maybe help somebody out? Um, you can always go online to heroinitiative.org and make a donation. Um, we are always looking for people to come out to the conventions and volunteer. Um, it, it's a great way to help. It doesn't cost anything. Most of the time you can get a pass in for the weekend and you're helping a lot of good people. Um, you know, if they, something happens to them, we step up and help them out of it. You know, they just have to call us and tell us what they need. I suggest you check out heroinitiative.org uh, to find out more about this great organization. Um, it is interesting when we, we watch a lot of the Marvel films, and we talked about this in that clip, uh, a lot of the characters were created by one man, and that was the legendary artist Jack Kirby. He worked uh, alongside Stan Lee to create the characters that have basically been the box office uh, gold for uh, Marvel Studios and even DC to some extent. Um, UNCP student Jonathan Fernandez uh, has a segment for us about the life of the great Jack Kirby. Hi everyone and welcome to Comic Culture's Splash Page where we explain something for the new comic book reader. Today we will be highlighting the life and career of the great Jack Kirby. Kirby was a prolific comic creator and has been credited as the father of Silver Age of Comics. Jack Kirby was born Jacob Kurtzberg in 1917 to Jewish immigrant parents in New York City. While growing up he had a strong interest in art and was for the most part self-taught. In the 1930s, he entered the comic book industry, and Kirby worked under a number of pen names at this time, including Jack Curtis, before settling on the name Jack Kirby. Kirby worked on a number of comic strips in multiple genres, ranging from westerns to science fiction. Kirby bounced around before he found a place at Timely Comics. In 1940, Kirby teamed up with fellow freelancer Joe Simon and created the character Captain America. The strip was an immediate success, selling out in days and subsequent issues having prints runs into the millions. Despite, despite there being agreements with Timely Comics to have the duo share in the profits, Simon and Kirby felt that they weren't receiving their fair share. They then packed their bags and moved to Timely Comics competitor, National Comics. The pair struggled to create new content and new characters as it seemed there was a new strip every week. National Comics then told them that they should take one of their weaker performing strips and do something with that. They took the character of Sandman and breathed new life into a weak series. They had now solidified themselves as professionals with a proven track record of success. Kirby continued to work, but was drafted during World War, II, World War II like many other comic book creators. After World War II, Kirby worked on many titles, including Boy Explorer Comics and Western Boys Ranch. Kirby, along with partner Joe Simon, found their, uh, their greatest success in the genre of romance. The strip was called Young Romance. 
This series was a serial, so that means there was no common storyline between the issues other than the fact that they were part of the same line. It was a huge hit that spawned many imitators and would go on to have a run that would last for years. After this huge hit, Kirby and Simon decided to form their own company called Mainline Publications. There were a variety of legal disputes with other publishers. This put a strain on the duo, who soon after parted ways amicably. Now free to do what he desired, Kirby returned to Timely, now called Atlas Comics, before he returned to National Comics. He worked on a number of issues in the 1950s, helping to foster a specific style at National that would become important later in the style of the entire medium. While he had left Atlas, he continued to freelance for them. It was then that he, when he met creator Stan Lee, it was with him he created the team known as the Fantastic Four. Kirby has struck gold yet again. This science-based superhero team with real problems resonated with readers and the issue was a rapid success. Working with Stan Lee, Kirby created many lines such as the Incredible Hulk, Thor, Iron Man, and the X-Men. He even had the great idea to have some of the more popular heroes team up to form a new team to face challenges and villains too big for any one hero to handle, the Avengers. Kirby was prolific and is often cited as the father of the Silver Age of comic books. He used bold colors and a distinctive art style that set the atmosphere of what was considered the Silver Age style. It wasn't just the artwork that made his work so distinctive. He had characters who were thoughtful and had real world problems. These characters had flaws that were identifiable and relatable to readers. This bright style, bold lines, and thoughtful characterization were the key attributes of the Silver Age of comics, and Kirby was the grand originator of it all. During his time with Atlas Comics, it of course became Marvel Comics. He enjoyed great success, but as 1970 approached, Kirby had grown discontent with his treatment at Marvel. Kirby felt that he was not given enough cre credit and control over the many projects that he oversaw in their initial stages. Kirby left Marvel for their rival's national comics, now called DC Comics. While at DC, Kirby went on to create a new series that intertwined many storylines and comics into a series of stories collectively called The Fourth World. The Fourth World followed the story of a cast of characters called the New Gods. They were beings of extreme good and extreme evil who fought each other in a never-ending struggle for control of the universe. Kirby lent his talent to other DC titles, but in 1976 he again switched companies for Marvel. Kirby cited lack of creative freedom, again as one of his reasons for his departure. Kirby went on to create several new concepts for the Marvel Universe, including the Eternals and the Celestials. These beings were then inspiration for a new line called the Inhumans, which has now become a key concept in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Kirby again felt mistreated by Marvel and left, but this time, instead of returning to DC, he decided to enter the world of animation. Kirby teamed up with Hanna-Barbera cartoons to work on and even create different projects. Two projects of his were Turbo Teen and the post-apocalyptic Thundar the Barbarian. This move wasn't as lucrative as he had hoped, but that didn't stop Kirby. Kirby entered a deal to create a creator-owned comic. This is, this is a departure from the typical work-for-hire concept that had been the industry standard. This was an important step in creator rights in the industry. Throughout the, the 80s, Kirby continued to do freelance work for DC and creating new content for animation, such as the animated project Centurions. In 1994, the comics world was saddened to learn that Kirby had passed away from heart failure. Kirby was a prolific creator that redefined his medium. Well, that's all we have time for today. I hope you learned, I hope you learned a little something. I'm Jonathan Fernandez, and thanks, thank you, and see you next time on Comic Culture's The Splash Page. We'll have another segment with Jonathan later on in our program. Now, we go from one of the legends of comics, Jack Kirby, to one of the rising stars uh, in comics, Mr. Cullen Bunn. Uh, we spoke to him about his uh, work for Marvel, for DC, for IDW, and his own book, Harrow County. How did growing up in North Carolina influence your writing? Well, you know, I, uh, my dad was, you know, from North Carolina. He grew up in Wilson, North Carolina, and I had uncles and, that grew up in North Carolina. And uh, my dad and my uncle Hugh McKay used to tell me plenty of ghost stories of things that, you know, about things that went bump of the night. They were always talking about haints and other kinds of uh, ghosts and goblins that grew out, you know, lived out in the woods or in old tobacco barns. And uh, a lot of that stuff just stuck with me and has just... Uh, it's just, it's just kind of infiltrated all my work, really. You, um, you've written your own work. You've published your own uh, books. But now you're working for IDW. You're working for Marvel. Um, how is that different? How is the discipline different from having to you know, work on your own stuff as opposed to having a deadline? Well, uh, you know, all of it, to me, all of it has a deadline. That really doesn't impact it in any way because usually with my creator-owned stuff, I'm working 
with an artist who has to work, and so that's my deadline. I'm making sure the artist is is fed, so to speak, with work. The biggest dif difference when working with like a creator-owned project like Harrow County or the Six Gun, or working on something like Uncanny X-Men, uh, creator-owned projects. Uh, I don't, my editor, it, it's, it's really all me. The editor doesn't uh, have a lot of say in what the story, where the story is going or what I can do with the story. While with a book like, uh, with a book for Marvel or DC or IDW, there's a lot more input from the editor about where I can go and what I can do with a, with a, with a certain character or, uh, or what other creators might be doing with those same characters. So there's a little more uh, uh, give and take with those books. I'm working, uh, it's a different kind of collaboration. Uh, with, with my own stuff, it's all me. With uh, The best way to describe it is with a Marvel or DC character, it's like going over to a friend's house and playing when you're a kid and playing with their, you know, their toys. You can, you, at the end of the day, you've got to give that toy back to them in the way it was originally, uh, you know, the, the way it was when you originally took it. Okay, and um, I guess our, our last question should be, where is the best barbecue? <laughs> The best barbecue. So I talked to my dad growing up in Wilson. Um, so Parker's Barbecue in, in Wilson is, was always my favorite. And uh, it's interesting because there's a, I don't know if it's still there. It's been years since I've been there. But there's a big picture of these kids all sitting on these fence posts at a, on a tobacco barn. And I remember my dad, whenever we go in there, says, that kid right there, that kid is me. And my dad was a storyteller. So I don't know if it's true that that kid was him or if it if it's not true, I also remember that same picture ended up in a, like a social studies book I had when I was in sixth grade, and I told my teacher, that's my dad, and she really did not like me lying that my dad was in the social studies book, but, you know, who knows if it was true or not. We hope to have Cullen on a future episode of Comic Culture. Now, one of the things that I really enjoy about Heroes Con is the fact that there is a wide variety of comic writers and artists uh, at the show. And I had the pleasure of coming across Monica Gallagher, who is uh, a web cartoonist and also has done some books for Oni Press. Uh, yeah, I've been doing comics for a while now, and I mainly do autobio, but I also have a web comic about roller derby, and I have two books that I have recently gotten published with Oni Press. Um, kind of young adult, one's about uh, teenage girls who work at an amusement park and one's about a high school girl who gets um, revenge on the boys who are mean to her with magical lip gloss. Okay, now I'm looking at uh, some of your original artwork here um, and it looks like for your web strip you're using the traditional uh, four panel layout that we yeah. would see in a newspaper. So what made you make that choice as an artist? Um, I think it was a challenge because most of my work before then had just been pages of regular comics. So doing it in a strip format forces you to be concise, figure out what you're doing, and both do like kind of gag a day strips or part of a longer arc, but still feels like it's worth reading that little four four box chunk. So it's kind of like just a challenge, and I wanted to see if I could do it. And um, so if we wanted to read, uh, pardon me, it's Bonnie and Collide, which by the way is an awesome title. <laughs> if I wanted to read that, uh, where would I find that on the web? It's at eatyourlipstick.com, which is my website. Um, now, moving from uh, the uh, Bonnie and Collide, you were talking about the books you're working on for Oni. Yeah. Um, so their books are published at a smaller size than traditional comics. So I'm wondering, as an artist, how you're working in that format compared to either the four panels or a full 10 by 15 uh, page? Um, it's actually kind of funny. I think there's something to printing smaller where it makes the art look a lot better. Like there's something about the detail that really comes through. So as fun as it is to work big, I like seeing it kind of shrunk down and you still get all the detail, but it, it makes it look, um, I don't know, more like more full in some way. But I like, I like working traditionally and big so that I get to kind of like zone out over a big giant piece of paper. <laughs> and, and what projects do you have uh, coming up? Um, I'm working on a couple of anthologies. One's for Rosie Press, which is also like a subsection of Oni, and um, an anxiety anthology called Sweaty Palms is coming out soon, which is exciting. And, um, and then, yeah, just like other pitches that haven't, haven't come through yet. But I still have my webcomic that's going on twice a week. So One of the great things about Bonnie and Collide 9 to 5 is that it's uh, a book, uh, pardon me, a, a webcomic that's published two times a week. You can go to eat my lips, eatyourlipstick.com uh, and check that out every Tuesday and Thursday. And Monica will be a guest on Comic Culture coming up very soon. Our next guest is artist Daryl Banks, who in the 1990s was part of the exciting time at DC Comics where they were revamping a lot of their characters. His work includes uh, runs on Green Lantern, where the character changed from Hal Jordan to Kyle Rayner. 
So let's take a look at that interview now. Daryl, when you were working on uh, Green Lantern, you were part of the storyline where we were switching over from Hal Jordan to uh, a whole new Green Lantern. It was uh, during a rather interesting time in, in comics history. So can you tell us a little bit about that time and what you were doing as an artist? Well, as an artist, it was definitely an honor to work on such an iconic character, but then having to kind of shake things up. You know, it was the 90s and, and change was definitely in the air. Sometimes it was a little gimmicky, but we wanted to uh, give something that the fans would really be able to latch on to, but we had no idea that it would uh, have the, the staying power to longevity that they had. But I think that as an artist, it was always a challenge to be able to make it visually interesting. And, uh, but it was a good kind of challenge, one that I definitely enjoyed and, and still do to this day. Now, um, was that early on in your career? Was that one of your, your first big jobs? Well, no, actually, I was about five years into my career in general, but that was towards the beginning of my working with the, the company DC Comics. Uh, prior, I had uh, done some fill-in work with the Legion of Superheroes, but really Green Lantern was, that was my first uh, project that really put me on the map, so to speak. Okay, now, um, one of the things about your Green Lantern is he has a very distinctive uh, styled mask. Now, was that something that you came up with? And, and as an artist, um, when you see that mask on an action figure, how does that make you feel? As, as a toy collector, uh, it almost brings a tear to my eye. It was, a, it was a goal that I never thought was achievable. So seeing something that I've designed become three dimensions, especially as a toy, that means a lot to me. The, the design inspiration for Kyle's mask was actually a, a 70s Marvel character called Sunfire. Uh, there's something about a mask that, that had a nose but very undefined. I don't know why that's always been appealing to me, but it, it certainly was. But it, with Sunfire it was different, but I, I always thought if I had a chance to design a, a, a type of face mask, I, I wanted to have some of those visual cues. Now, granted, there's a lot of, a lot of difference, but that was the jumping off point. Um, really, it was it was something that I wanted I wanted to be form fitting, but not tight to the face like let's say Nightwing. But I, as I understand it, it was difficult for some artists to draw. But some have made it way too thick, and some it, it, it didn't feel metallic. But uh, I don't know that it, it means that I'm the only one that can do it. No, <laughs> no, certainly there were a lot of artists that could do it well, especially like artists such as Paul Pelletier, who did many issues uh, of Green Lantern. So. So that was that was the that was the, uh, the inspiration for that for that costume design. We actually uh, will have Daryl Banks on an upcoming episode of Comic Culture for a full uh, half-hour interview. Our next conversation is a very short one with Eric Powell, who is the writer and artist behind one of my favorite comics, The Goon, which is a combination of horror, humor, and heartbreak. And we talked to him about The Goon and about his new project, Hillbilly. The Goon seems to be wrapped up. You're working on a new project. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I've been doing The Goon for, you know, almost 20 years now. <laughs> 17 years. Um, and uh, we kind of wrapped up the storyline that we had going at Dark Horse. Uh, and I, I felt it was time to start trying some new stuff that had been sitting in my, you know, sketchbooks for a long time. And the one that I was uh, uh, most excited to get to is called Hillbilly. And uh, it's kind of a sword and sorcery kind of story, but takes place in a world that's uh, set in the Appalachian Mountains. I started back my publishing company to put this out, Albatross Funny Books, and uh, the first issue comes out uh, the 29th. Yeah. Um, now it's interesting because as a, a writer and artist, you sometimes combine genres in uh, amazing ways. There are a number of really funny moments in The Goon, and then you will have a real heartbreaking uh, story arc. So how do you as a writer, how do you work that balance and, and tell those stories? Uh, I, I really just go by my gut and if, uh, it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting thing trying to do comedic timing and making something work and you have to know like you can't have an emotional beat here and then expect to go straight to a, a, a comedy beat or it just falls flat, you know, it's, so it's, it's it's uh, not any kind of formula or anything that I know, oh, like I can't, I have to go two pages before I do this or anything like that. It's really just a gut feeling of the pacing of the story and how it works. Um, uh, so yeah, it's, it's all just done by feel. 
Now, I wish I could say that Eric Powell will be a guest on an upcoming episode of Comic Culture, but as of yet, he's not. So if you know him, tell him to do our show. Uh, right now, we're going to have another visit with Jonathan Fernandez on a segment we call The Pull List. Hello, I'm Jonathan Fernandez, and welcome to Comic Culture's The Pull List, the segment all about what comics, graphic novels, and specific storylines you should be reading. Before we begin, if you're looking to buy the books for a younger reader, we do ask that you read the book yourself to determine if it is appropriate. We try to warn our viewers, but we won't always catch everything. The warning is especially true today because we'll be recommending titles that are distinctly for the more mature reader. Please be aware that the content in the following series are not suitable for immature audiences. All the books have completed runs and can be enjoyed without waiting. Our first series, called The Boys, by Garth Ennis. Similar to other titles I've recommended, this is another story of a more realistic world with superheroes. In this world, superheroes are not the virtuous creatures they are portrayed to be in the media. They can be corrupted by power and even negligent in their duties. It is this negligence that introduces us to the main character of Huey Campbell. Huey was an innocent bystander when a superhero crashed into his girlfriend, killing her instantly. The thing that crushed Huey the most was that the hero felt no empathy or shame in the death of an innocent woman. A distraught Huey is then recruited by a secret CIA black ops team called The Boys, whose sole purpose is to police the superhero community. Each member's life has been negatively affected in some way by superheroes. What follows is a story of shadow games, detective work, and layers of conspiracy. It's a fun read that you won't want to put down. The second book I'm going to recommend is a series called Wanted. This book is the inspiration of the 2008 movie starring Angelina Jolie, but that only loosely inspired the movie. Just like in the movie, we are introduced to a corporate drone named Wesley Gibson. Wesley is being cheated on by his girlfriend, bullied at work, and harassed by a local street gang. Wesley is fine with living a perfectly mediocre life. This all changes when the character of Fox enters his life and kills everyone in a donut store. Fox then informs Wesley that she works for an organization of supervillains that secretly run the world. They can commit any crime they wish as long as they do not expose themselves to the general population. Fox reveals that Wesley is in fact the son of a very famous supervillain named The Killer. The Killer has been recently assassinated and Fox would like Wesley to fill his shoes. It takes some convincing, but after reflecting on his life, he decides to take Fox up on her offer. Working under a supervillain named The Professor, we learn that there used to be lots of villains and heroes, but after a long war, the villains won. Using a combination of science and magic, the villains were able to wipe the no this knowledge from the world. Only traces remained, and this is the source of comic books and movies. Many heroes who survived, in fact, believed themselves to be actors who played heroes in various media. Wesley becomes a villain and along the way has to figure out who killed his father and why. This book is full of violence and crude entertainment. Whenever you think there's a poignant remark that is about being made, you're brought back to reality by its crass nature. You're gonna love it. Well, that's all we have for you today. I hope something caught your eye. I'm Jonathan Fernandez, and thanks for watching. I'd like to thank you for watching this episode of Comic Culture. If you'd like to find out more about our program, you can visit uptoncomics.com, where you'll be able to find links to all of our episodes. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you again soon.